Okay. Um, hi, everybody. Um, thanks for joining us. This is the third of our Social Farms and Gardens webinars. Um, thanks for joining us on a very Sunday bank, uh, sunny bank holiday mo uh, Monday. Um, I can't quite believe it's a bank holiday. Um, we are running these webinars in response to um, the answers that we had um, to our member survey, which we put out um, a few weeks ago now into the impact that COVID-19 was having um, on our members. Um, and uh, this is one of a series that we're, we're doing on funding because the biggest issue um, that was coming back from the membership in their answers was that um, a huge number of people had had uh, massive losses of income. Um, so understandably, a lot of people out there were looking to grant funders and looking at different ways that they might be able to bring some money into the organisation um, to try and sustain them through um, some very difficult times. So um, we've put together a series of webinars um, around sort of the funding theme so we've had some already and we will have some more running this week so we'll talk about those in a little bit more detail later um, and I'm really just going to sort of top and tail today's session so I'm not going to talk too much um, I'm going to go through now a little bit of like webinar housekeeping just so that you know what to expect um, so um, all of attendees so all of you are muted um, and your video isn't on so it's a bit weird for us because we know you're there but we can't see or hear you um, so if you want to communicate with us um, please use the Q&A function um, so that means that you can speak to us and you can submit questions throughout the webinar um, so in a little while I'm going to hand over to Alison and Heidi who are here with us today um, and I'm going to monitor the Q&A um, what's coming in on the Q&A and kind of compile those and then I'll be putting those questions um, to the panel at the end. Also use that function if you're having like a technical issue and I will do my best to help. I can't promise that I will be able to help but I'll certainly do my best. Um, there's also the chat function. Um, I'm not going to monitor that as closely just so that I can keep an eye on the Q&As. So please do use that um, to speak to each other and if you've got particular things that you want to flag up or resources that you want to share or just things to add then please use that but if you need my attention immediately please use the Q&A's because I might not see the chat one. Um, we are recording today's webinar today um, so if you miss bits you can always go back and watch it we'll be putting it um, online hopefully on our website but definitely through our YouTube channel um, and uh, the, all the other sessions that we're doing will also go on there. And if you get kicked out unintentionally from the webinar, um, your internet goes down or anything, um, you should just be able to use the same link to rejoin and get back in. Okay. So today's webinar is on finding and approaching funders. Um, and I've got my two colleagues here, Alison and Heidi, who are going to be taking us through this. Um, I don't know if you both just want to say hello and introduce yourself. Unfortunately, we've had some kind of technical issue um, and we can't see Heidi today, um, but we can hear her. Sorry about that. Um, but yeah, um, do you two want to just say hello? Um, yeah. shall you you start, go. Alison. Okay. <laughs> Um, I'm, I'm Alison, so I am um, the Business Development Coordinator here at um, Social Farms and Gardens. Uh, been here for about five years now, um, looking at particularly different ways of bringing funding into the organisation, but also, um, yeah, your kind of classic uh, trusts and funds, funds as well. Um, so hopefully we'll have share a few of those ideas with you today. Um, and I'm Heidi. I'm the operations manager for Social Farms and Gardens, which means a wide variety of things. Some of it does mean um, doing lots of funding bids, both in the UK and um, also for EU funders. I've done quite a bit of that too. Um, and I work really closely with um, Sophie and Alison, but also a, a number of other colleagues that are spread across uh, the UK. Obviously, I'm not doing as much uh, traveling as I was doing before, but we're still communicating as much as we can uh, via other methods. So, so that's me, really. Okay, um, great. Thank you. I'm going to hand over to you two now just to sort of run through the presentation. Um, and as I said at the beginning, for anyone that wants to ask any questions, um, please just send them through to me through the Q&A and then I will be asking them um, once we've finished with the main presentation. Okay, great. Okay, so I'm going to kick off and we're just going to, you know, today's um, presentation really is about 
talking and finding out what funding is out there and approaching funders. Um, so here's some sort of a list of sort of some of the things that you might want to think about when you're st first starting to think about uh, what funding you might go for. Um, so first one is really just understanding what you do and why you do it and what your unique selling point is. And that might be a mission statement or it might just be something in your head that you know very much about your organization. Um, not everyone has a mission statement, but it will be, it will be sort of all about what you do and why you do it. Um, you need to think about your geographical remit and the area that you cover. Um, there will be funders out there that will only cover very specific areas and you may fall into that area. Um, so it's worth being very clear about where it is you work. Um, you may work in a much wider area or it might be in a very, very specific town, city, uh, or local authority area. Um, you need to look at your annual income and you you that includes understanding what your costs are um to run um and what things you charge for what are your day rates for people what are your what kind of income have you got coming in from things like rental you might be renting out space or renting out a, a room um, so you need to understand what all those rates would be um, before you get going so that you make sure that you include the right costs. Um, and just as an aside, we did do a webinar on Thursday about cash flow, um, which is another very useful um, way to understand what your income is and how much money you've got available to you at any given time. Um, and there is a template for that. So uh, if anyone's interested in the cash flow template, um, let Sophie know and we can send that to you um, because it may be useful for you. Going on to the beneficiaries, this is the people who work with you and support you. Um, and they could be such a wide, uh, range of people. It could be young people, it could be people with disabilities, it could be older people, it could be anyone in your specific location. Um, but you will have beneficiaries who you are aware of that, that work with you and, and support your organization. You need to make sure you understand what your legal structure is. You may be a charity, you may, may be a company limited by guarantee, um, you may be some sort of constituted group or you might even be an unincorporated organization, which means you don't have a legal structure yet, but um, it is recognized. Um, it's just not as um, formal as some of the other ones. So be clear about what your legal structure is. Um, your partners, who most funders like it when you work with partners and have other people that are supporting and, and doing work with you. Um, so you may have partnerships with local authorities, housing associations, other kinds of community groups, other gardens, farms, schools, could be a wide range of partners that you've got um, working with you. Um, you should be looking at your budget and what you find it hard to get money for because you're applying for funding and so you want to make sure that the funding that you get is for m things that you really need. Um, is it equipment you need? Do you have core services that you need to fund? People you need to fund? Training that needs funding? Different funds will have different kinds of money that they're willing to give and, and some will be very specific about what they won't fund as well. Um, so it could be that if you're working in education, they won't fund anything to do with schools, let's say, or anything, any work on education. Uh, alternatively, that might be exactly what they fund. So um, look at what kinds of money you do need and then see if that fits with the, org um, with the funder. And then lastly, sort of project ideas. What do you want to fund and why do you want to fund it? Um, and be really clear about what it is you're looking for money for. So that's me. Oh. Right. I uh, will move on to the, I'm taking over the next slide and um, looking at various different types of funders because I think sometimes it can be a little bit overwhelming um, or just a bit confusing as to who, who's kind of there to be able to provide uh, support for you, financial support for your organisation. 
Um, so just a bit of an overview of what these different ones are. Um, so a trust is um, kind of a pot of money that's been set aside it's often by someone when someone's died, it's the money that they've made during their lifetime um, and they've left it as an endowment and it'll be looked after by trustees um, who have very, and it has a very specific purpose. So a very um, specific remit on what it can be used for. Um, when I say specific, I mean that could just be supporting, you know, uh, I live in Shropshire, so it could be supporting public good in Shropshire which is obviously very specific, but it actually it's quite broad if you're within Shropshire and you're working in a community garden um, or a care farm or any kind of site like that, you're obviously perfectly able to that. So that's quite trust comes in. And a lot of trusts are very well known. Um, some of them are a little bit harder to come across and a lot of them I find are not overly they may not have a website because they don't have a lot of money to invest in something like that um, and they're not overly forward in how you actually contact them so it's always worth looking at the charity commission website um, to find out a little bit more about them because they'll have registered or um, uh, submitted their annual accounts and you can read through their accounts and see what kind of things they will support how much money they've got how much you might be able to think about and if you read their reports it might have there might be kind of a focus on a specific thing. For example, they might be really interested in children with disabilities or a specific regional area. Um, so I would always recommend doing your research into any trust that doesn't have a very um, strong online presence or one that you don't know that well. Uh, foundations are kind of similar. I'm actually going to talk about them when I come on to corporates in a little bit. Um, government. Um, obviously, government funding can look different across the UK, Scotland, England, Wales, Northern Ireland can be quite different. So what you find in England may be very different to what's available elsewhere. Um, and often it's distributed through another grant maker. So it might be distributed through the lottery or through your local authority or through a government agency like RAP in England. Um, so sometimes they can be a little bit confusing because you're not too sure where the funding might be coming from. But it's always worth doing that research to find out. And I think one thing to be aware of when you're looking at government funding is that there does tend to be a, quite a tendency towards quite thorough applications and there'll always be a very strong focus on um, monitoring and evaluation towards the end because it will be influencing public policy um, and that's that's a bit different for your trust funds where actually it's something that they're within their remit they're wanting to give to. Um, so just thinking about if you're going to be approaching government funding, have you got capacity and how will you go about monitoring and have you got experience in those areas? Um, obviously that's not always the case with each fund, but it's just worth being aware that you might want to just make sure you are focused on that. Um, in terms of coronavirus um, funds, particularly there obviously is a lot available through government at the moment um, that many charities are eligible for. Um, so if you do look at the um, government website, it's the best place for the most up-to-date information on that and on the funds there. And it does take a, a bit of going through to see what would be the most appropriate for you at this time. Um, lottery. Uh, obviously, hopefully you all know that the lottery, National Lottery has quite some money that can sh be shared. Um, and uh, Awards for All is their kind of classic uh, grant that's pretty open to anything for up to £10,000. It covers core costs, it covers capital, it covers all sorts of projects. Um, so that's always one that's worth looking at. You can make an application every 12 months. I'm going to just double check. Sophie, is that right? Uh, yeah, that's right. And I'm, I, I'm just going to add, um, whilst I'm speaking, that obviously we've got a session with an England uh, Lottery Community Fund officer on Wednesday. Um, but I did speak to her last week um, and they, are, they have launched um, last week an emergency fund. Um, uh, and all of their funding decisions over the next six months will entirely be sort of COVID-19 related um, and it's very much worth just reading about those funding priorities on their website because that's all been updated now um, in line with the money that they're, they're getting from the government so they are distributing a government grant much like you just described. Um, yes, uh, absolutely at the moment it is all about um, emergency response and a lot of that is around 
supporting groups who are on the front line supporting communities so a lot of your groups who are actually out there working with very vulnerable people in your communities are absolutely the types of groups that are eligible for these funding pots um, the other thing the lottery are really keen on is showing uh, community decision making um, so as you are all community-based groups working in your communities with communities on the boards or the trustees or the lead volunteers um, that, that you're absolutely the kinds of organisations that should be applying for some of those lottery, um, the lottery funds that are out there. Um, and then finally, um, corporates. Um, a lot of large businesses and even some of the smaller ones have a foundation linked to them where often it's kind of tax, but also to show that they're doing a good thing. Um, so they might have a, a foundation linked to them. So you've got companies like Screwfix, or Warburton's, um, or can't think of it's always hard to think of any off the top of your head, isn't it? But if you go onto our Jusons. website, Jusons, no, they don't no? Have they, they, have, they have a they have a charity competition, Jusons. Oh right, okay. Um, <laughs> so it's all sorts of different different foundations, but it works in much the same way. So they'll have a specific remit for their funds, and you can apply for that. But like trusts, um, they'll generally be fairly straightforward application forms. Um, DS Smith is another one. They're, they're, all of these ones that I've mentioned have got very short online application forms and you can just bang them out in, in. If you know all that information that Heidi's just talked about, you know your income, so you know you're eligible, you know your beneficiaries, you know you're eligible, you know your geographical remit, so you know you're eligible, and you have your mission statement and your project lined up, then they're very quick to get those, those ones out. And if you're a member of Social Farms and Gardens, within our website, there is a list um, within the members area of lots of those foundations. So it would be worth if you've got, I mean, it's not the most thrilling of tasks, but if you've got some time to go through them and just see which ones you can, you can get out nice and quickly, because they can be quite a quick one to do, although not always the quickest of turnarounds. So it is worth noting there. And some of them have closed at the moment due to the, the, due to the pandemic. Okay, but that is an ongoing list that's updated on our website. So if it's not relevant now, it might be six months, 12 months down the line. Okay. Um, the other ones I'm not going to focus on too much, but it's just worth thinking of in, about your situation and whether these might be ways that you could go. So looking at high wealth individuals, um, running events that would attract them or anything like that. Local community um, and individual donations on a smaller, smaller scale. Um, contracts and tenders with local authority, again at the moment they've kind of dried up a little bit or they're very specific in regards to the pandemic, um, but there are lots of um, kind of uh, uh, en engines that uh, can give you a daily, daily notification of contracts that are available with the local councils or with larger councils or other, other organisations who might be contracting out um, some of their work that you may be eligible for um, applying for and you can just get those notifications so it doesn't take too long um, to look at what might be worthwhile for you. Um, also loans and bonds that are specific for the charity sector if you're looking at something that might be a revenue project um, so you could pay that back. Um, if you look on CAF online um, or Charity Bank, they've got a lot more information on them if that's some, a route you wanted to go down for a specific project. Um, and then the other one, which we, we don't think is specifically always very relevant to our um, sector, but it might be depending on the type of space that you run, is looking at legacies. And again, if you look, so that's where if someone dies, they might leave a legacy to you and to your organisation. Um, and that's always something that's just worth looking at if that's suitable for your, for your site. Okay. Um, so how do you come across all these people and where, where are they all found? Um, I would absolutely recommend um, signing up for some newsletters if you can, for some notification fund finders. Um, so there's one called Get Grants, which we have a partnership with. Um, they also run uh, training um, on fundraising and bid writing and that kind of thing. Um, so if it's something that you are more fully invested in, it might be worth looking at what they can offer. And um, members, again, of Social Farms and Gardens do get a discount on what they offer. Um, so they've got a good funding finder and they've got a free funding finder newsletter that goes out, that comes out on a monthly basis with new funds. 
Grants Online is very comprehensive, lots and lots of grants on there, um, funds on there that you can apply for, for all sorts of different, so it does take a while to trawl through, because obviously a lot of them won't be applicable for you. Um, but there, it is a very comprehensive list. Um, Funding Central likewise, and also the Institute of Fundraising, if you go into their coronavirus pages as well, they've got some really good information on there for ones for funds that are specific um, to responding to the current situation. Um, and then obviously what we talk about a lot with our members is that actually you're based in your local community, you're very um, like local um, sites uh, and charities supporting a specific need in a specific area. So actually it's worth looking at your local support sector body. So I know some of them are a lot more um, better, better resource than others, um, but many of them will either have resources or links to links to funds that are available, um, and that's uh, the same across the UK. Um, yeah, so it's it's always worth checking them out as well. And what I would suggest is the best option is rather than just trawling through everything or kind of haphazardly as choose which one you want to go for, you may miss some funds, but at least you've got your sanity um, and just sticking to one which is going to work for you and accept that you can't apply for everything and not everything will be as suitable but at least then you've, you've got something a little bit more manageable to cope with okay um as i've already mentioned the social farms and gardens website has within the members area we've had we've put this list of businesses that have these foundations that are suitable we've decided to put it in there rather than a notifications in all the newsletters so that it's a space that's always there and it's not filling up our newsletters unnecessarily um, but any other funds or immediate things might appear on social media um, or in our newsletters if they're suitable for a specific um, uh, group of beneficiaries or a specific area. So do just keep an eye on the, the stuff that we're sending out that is relevant to this sector. Um, I think it's really important to keep a record of who's funded you in the past and who has not funded you so that you don't waste time going back to the same people who constantly re re refusing you or you look at ones if they funded you before it's quite a high chance that they might be interested in funding you again so just keeping a simple spreadsheet um, that has a we'll send this round as, as well I mean it's really easy but not what the name of the fund was who applied when how much and what was that for and then you can look at whether you go back and ask for more once that's finished it's just that, that person that funder already knows you and already has a relationship with you and so particularly with the trusts, if you go back and ask for more, it's, it's, an, it's an easier ask and it's less work because you've already done that research. It's also a really good way if you've got changing personnel to ensure that the knowledge is passed on through your organisation, even if the people and the volunteers who are involved in that are changing. And then finally, just to note that all staff and volunteers can support in fundraising. Some of you may just be volunteer groups, so everyone kind of is involved in fundraising. Some of you may have staff or um, other volunteers who are very much not involved in that. But just for everyone to be aware of your financial situation is valuable because it can help um, you to consider where you could maybe save on some costs and it helps I mean, obviously, a lot of us are so thrifty anyway and always using, you know, um, as little as we can to, for the maximum benefit. But actually, if everyone's aware of what you need funding for and what you need to support within your organisation, they can help to save costs within your organisation. But they can also be on the lookout and say, oh, did you see that I went down to Tesco's and they're actually doing a they've got like bucket raisers. We could maybe do that. Or, oh, actually, hang on. I think I've spoken to that person before and they've donated something or they run this company and actually having those networks and making it really obvious within your organization um, that you do need support and that that can come from a wide range of, um, of corners is, is really valid. Okay, I think that was all I wanted to say on that so I think you might get to listen to Heidi again now. <laughs> okay, here we go. Right, so um just as Alison sort of pointed out, um, funders differ wildly and you can find a funder that wants you to fill out bucket, uh, tons of pages of information it, or it may just be a simple letter they're looking for. Um, 
it, it really is amazing, the difference. So it's worth sort of trawling through, seeing if you can find funding bids that you think you can cope with that aren't too long. I mean, I have just finished writing a funding bid that was over 200 pages long and took me two months to write, but it was a lot of money. So you would expect to do a lot more work, but you may find that you can find ones that are relatively quick and easy. Um, what you need to make sure is when you, you go for funder that um, you're checking the eligibility, eligibility of your organization. And to find out really, the first thing, most funders have some sort of guidance. So you need to go first thing, I know it's really boring, but it is well worth reading the guidance because you may quickly find out that you aren't eligible or you may find that you fit really, really well and that just seems like the right funder for you to go for. Um, so once you've checked that you're eligible and your, the organization's eligible um, and your idea is eligible, you need to make sure that the, it fits with what they're looking for. Does your big idea meet what they're looking for? Um, if they're working with youth, do you work with youth? Um, and does, does your idea meet the needs of the funder? Um, if you talk to others about their experience of the funder, that's useful too, because there are some funders that are really difficult to deal with and, and they're sort of known. Um, and if you know that you're going to go for something and you've got somebody else that's looking um, or has had money from that funder as well, it's worth talking to them to find out how the experience goes and what the reporting is like as well. Because if you do get money from that funder and the reporting is really onerous, you may want to think twice because you may not be able to cope with that. So see if you can find out a bit more about their experience. Um, obviously you really have to understand the priorities of the funder. It's not so much about what your priorities are, it's about what theirs are and does it fit? Can you make those two things fit together? Um, if you take note of your project and budget information, they're going to, you know, that is something they'll usually ask you about. Um, so if you have a business plan, that might be useful. If you have any kind of report that you've written, that might be really, really useful as well to share with them. Because they're, if you've not had money from them before, they're going to want to get to know you. Um, and that might be a useful way for them to understand more about what you do and why you do it. Um, don't be afraid to pick up the phone and give them a call. People, there are a number of funders that are, although you've got some that might just want you to post them in an anonymous form, others are willing to talk to you and chat through your idea before you even get to the point where you're sitting down and writing a long application or even a short application. And you can, I, I know for sure that the lottery is one that you can definitely call and talk through your idea with before you go any further and they'll give you a steer on whether they think that's something that they could fund or not. Um, and obviously it's okay to not apply if you go through all this and think this just does not fit my organization or it's going to take far too much time for the amount of money they're going to offer me. Um, that's fine. Don't apply if it doesn't work out that, that that's the right fit for you. Um, I think tomorrow in the, the webinar that Alison and Sophie are going to run, it's going to, we're going to look much more on like actually what to do in the application and all the ways of do, writing a, a good funding bid. But for now, that's kind of my suggestion on approaching funders before you get to that point. That's so, great, Heidi. Um, yeah, I was just going to add, um, if I can, that one thing I found really useful um, uh, with when you're looking at organisations to approach is a lot of the grant funders will have a list of who they've funded in the past. Um, and so that can give you a, like a real extra steer on mm. the types of projects and organisations that um, the panel is, um, is keen on supporting. Um, so having a look through that and, and also because some um, some funders will say you can apply for you know around about this much money or a maximum and a minimum and some don't give you that and it's really hard to know how much you should go for um, and so again looking through projects that they've funded in the past will give you a rough idea of kind of ballpark figure um, how much they tend to give in, in grants um, and so, yeah, that's that's definitely something I'd recommend having a look through. Um, and the other thing I'd, I'd also look at is um, the turnaround time. Um, it's all if you might find like your dream funder, but they might not make a decision for 
five months and you need the money now and it's urgent then they're, they're not your dream funder um and also just how detailed it is like i've certainly put months of work into bids um that weren't successful and um i think on in hindsight pro probably we had quite a low chance to begin with so if we kind of looked at that as a whole we might have chosen to spend that time in a different way rather than applying for yeah for the money so it's a bit like carrot seeds really isn't it you feel really bad picking out the ones that are a little bit weak and you kind of feel you should get them all a go but actually it's worth investing in the strong ones yeah weed them out weed them out yeah <laughs> Um, so if you, I'm just going to pick up this as our last kind of major slide. Um, if you uh, maybe don't want to go down writing funding bids route, there are other ways that you can bring in resources to your organisation that you might want to consider. Um, so we'll put a few examples and we will share these slides afterwards so you can click on the links. Um, Heidi and I are big fans of writing a wish list um, because Actually, when you're speaking to particularly businesses, um, they love to give something tangible if they can, but they need to know what that is. So actually just asking, and you may not ever get any of the things on your list, but it's not gonna hurt putting them on there. And particularly at the moment, there is a big push for people to support each other. And people, my husband works in the NHS and they've just been inundated with Easter eggs. And he said, actually, they don't really need any more Easter eggs, but it's lovely because people just want to give. Um, and uh, and actually, if you're saying what you do need, that's a lot more of a helpful way for people to be able to give to you. So just popping a wish list somewhere on your website or just having a list somewhere on your social media every now and again, not being afraid to ask um, for what the kind of things that uh, might support your organisation, whether that's some tools or um, a notice board or some compost, um, you know, whatever it is, or, or more volunteers. Um, I'm just popping that on there. Um, I guess we've kind of referred to this a little bit already, but using your existing contacts in your networks. So this, I guess, is more of the long game, um, but there are some funds that you're only eligible to apply for if you're invited. Um, some funds are not even kind of invited, it's just kind of offered to you, but you have to be in there or to get any chance. So it's really important to develop your networks, um, to use your trustees in particular, um, and to use the wider people within your community and make sure that people know what you're, who you are, where you are, what you're doing, what your impact is and investing that time in, in that kind of self-publicity so that then you can be found when these opportunities do arise. Um, and that's where it's really important. Um, we talked about having a mission statement earlier, having something in your head. Actually, having something in your head is great and that's really important. And actually, if you're the person who can uh, share that with passion is fantastic and that's a really good way of kind of getting that passion shared but actually if everyone in your organization isn't able to share it in quite the same way it's quite useful to have that mission statement written down so that then a wider pool of people can be sharing that with others who are potential funders in the future um, kind of linked to that I suppose is individual donors and you could do that on a more formal basis you could set up a friend scheme um, lots of organizations particularly parks might do that and that friend scheme will look different for whoever, whichever organisation you are and how you want to do that, whether you want that to be kind of investment in the, in the space and you get some vegetables, whether it's literally just a kind of membership fee at the beginning of the year, or whether it is just a kind of a giving of time um, to your organisation. But something like a friend scheme might work quite nicely. Um, crowdfunding's often mentioned. So crowdfunding is all about building um, a kind of supporter base who are also giving financially to your organisation. Um, I think probably it kind of hit, hit a peak about three or four years ago. Um, lots of crowdfunding, you know, both, both in the private sector and in the, in the charity sector um, taking off. Um, so Heidi, Sophie and I all worked on a project called Growing Together, um, where it's social farms and gardens. Um, and we put a couple of briefings together, which I've linked to here. Um, crowdfunding is a lot of work. It requires a lot of online presence um, and resources, um, but it can work for some organisations, particularly if it, if it hits the right tone, if it's the right note. Um, and um, if it does go well, it can go really, really well and kind of exceed your expectations, but it's all about getting the right balance there. 
Um, and again, just looking at whether it's worth your investment if it's if it's something that is going to catch people's imagination. Um, gift aid, if you're not already claiming gift aid on any do individual donations that you're receiving, um, have a little look and see how you can do that. It's fairly straightforward. Um, so yeah, that's there. And then community shares is a it's a bit like a, a friend scheme, but a little bit more formal. So actually investing into your into your site. Um, I think the most famous example is Fordall Farm in North Shropshire, um, who launched a community shares and about 18,000 shares they sold and managed to buy their farm um, and kind of going great guns now, 10, 15 years on. Um, so their story's on their website again, so you can link through to that and have a little look at that. Yours doesn't have to be quite so um, mammoth, um, but a community shares option is, is always quite nice. And again, I think actually there are some resources on our website that we put together when we were working on growing together. So I'll dig them out and have a little look and um, we'll add them into this presentation as well. Okay, so that's just, I mean, obviously that's not the extent of the alternative approaches, but that's just a few to kind of whet your appetite a little bit. Alison, I just wanted to add um, onto your slide there about, I mean, I completely agree with your like building, using your existing contacts and networks. And I think it's worth saying that that really applies to social networks as well. Um, and it's totally, I understand it's not for everybody kind of in their personal lives, but I think, you know, we live in a world now where um, social media presence for groups and community groups and organizations is so important. And it really is worth um, investing the time in kind of building up that regular presence and that sort of following base because you never know when you might need that. Um, so, I mean, I know a group that I've worked with in the past, um, we did have a good sort of presence online and then unexpectedly had a break in, had all our power tools stolen, um, talked about that through our web, through our social media. Um, and within about, I think it was like a day, um, we'd, uh, somebody had started a crowdfunder, they'd raised the money um, and a local business donated three power tools to replace the ones that had been stolen, which was just would never have happened without having, you know, having had that network and basically sharing nice photos of vegetables and chickens. Um, and equally, you know, if you are, um, you know, thinking about launching any kind of crowdfunding or just any kind of scheme or just looking to connect with local businesses, um, then yeah, that, that social media network is yeah, sorry for putting in, I just wanted to add it. Yeah, I think that's absolutely valid. And also, I think we are very lucky in our sector. We have some fantastic pictures throughout the year. Um, and actually, you know, images um, tell a thousand story, stories, or share a thousand words, or whatever the saying is. But um, we actually, by sharing those pictures and those images of what you're doing in your site, um, even if you can't share people at the moment, you can still share what, the, what nature's doing um, and, and how you're impacting people through that so i do think we're very fortunate and we should make the most of that yeah actually i'm just wondering if we should flag up the fact that um on our um social media pages we you can if you want to share what's going on in your space and it's operating you can you know we're taking videos and pictures um and we're very happy to share the put them on social media and you can put them on yourself i think sophie's going to talk about that later anyway but uh, yeah that's if you right want to just share with everyone yeah, and an awful lot of members are using social media, obviously, to keep in touch with um, volunteers and members that they can't otherwise um, see in person at the moment. So I think it's sort of more important than ever. Okay. That's the end of um, the content we've kind of got to share. So if we just flag up upcoming webinars and then are we doing Q&A, Sophie? Yeah, sure. Yeah. So I just wanted to highlight the webinars that we've got coming up. There will be more, so um, things that I'm doing this week is scheduling our next round of them, so do keep in touch with the website um, on what's coming up. Um, and yeah, if anybody has sort of specific questions about what we've been talking about today, um, I know it's, um, yeah, it's quite a broad subject, obviously, um, but you, by all means send them in now um, or, you know, you'll be able to, to get in touch. Do you want to go on to the next slide as well, Alison? 
Yeah, and just I wanted to highlight as well that we have recently launched or relaunched our Social Farms and Gardens members group. Um, so if, if there's anything kind of funding specific or just general um, general kind of work stuff um, that you're keen to chat to other members about, it's a really great space to kind of share ideas and ask for support and ask for, ask for inspiration. Um, so please do uh, feel free to join that and use it to sort of chat to other members as well. Okay, we haven't had any questions come in, um, so I'm just going to assume that that is because you were both incredibly clear um, and covered everything in great detail. Um, so if nothing needs to be submitted question-wise, I will say thank you very much to Alison and Heidi for going through that. Um, as I said, we will be... Um, putting this session up online um, so if there's uh, links and stuff that you missed then please do sort of check back and you can skip through and find the relevant bits um, and keep in touch and watch out for future webinars so thanks very much everybody <laughs> bye thank you